Welcome to the Physics Classroom's video tutorial on static electricity. The topic of this video is charging by conduction. And here's what we wish to learn today. What exactly is charging by conduction and how does it take place? And how can the results of charging by conduction be predicted and explained? I'm Mr. H. Let's get started. Charging by conduction is one of several methods used to charge a neutral object. This particular method involves bringing a charge conducting object to and making contact with a neutral conducting object. The result of this process is object B, the original neutral object, now acquires the same type of charge that object A has. And object A remains charged, only has less of the same type of charge that it originally had. If the charged object, object A, is negatively charged and we use it to charge object B, the neutral object, then B, of course, will acquire a negative type of charge. And A, when done, will still have a negative charge, just less of it than it had before. How do we explain this? Well, we explain it by the transfer of electrons. We can imagine object A having an excess of electrons, negative electrons, and of course, like charges repel, so those electrons don't like each other. When A is touch to B, those electrons see opportunity and they would like to spread themselves further apart so many electrons move from object A to object B, thus making B charged negatively. But since not all of the electrons have left object A, but only some of them, object A still has a negative type of charge, only less than it had before. Now let's suppose that object A is charged positively, and we use it to charge object B, the neutral object. And when contact is made and object A and B are pulled apart, we learn that object B now acquires a positive charge. Object A still has the same type of charge, positive, but it's less charged than before the process happens. Now how do we explain this? There's two very common incorrect explanations that we really need to be careful about. And the first one is uh, the explanation that object A transferred positive protons to object B. And that's incorrect because protons are bound up in the nucleus of the atoms and incapable of being transferred from one object to another by an electrostatic event. It would take a nuclear event to split that nucleus open and get those protons out for transferring. That doesn't happen by touching two conductors together. So that's the wrong explanation. The second wrong explanation goes like this. Object A transferred positive electrons to object B, and, and that's a no-no as well. So what is the right explanation? Well, it has to involve electrons, and electrons are negative. So let's think a little bit about object A and object B. Object A is positive, so it has protons, it has electrons, but more of the protons than the electrons, you might say it's short on electrons. And then object B is neutral, so it has protons, it has electrons in equal numbers. Now some of the electrons in object B, when touched to object A, notice a positive charge. And electrons love positive. And so some, not all, of the electrons in object B migrate onto A, being attracted by the positive charge. And there's a transfer of electrons from B to A. When a neutral object loses electrons, it becomes positive. So object B is positive. And when a positively charged object gains some electrons, its po amount of positive charge it has will decrease. And so that explanation is perfectly consistent with the observations of what the result is. And it follows our rules about the nature of electrons and protons. Now, like all of our charging methods, the charging by conduction method follows the law of conservation of charge, which states that objects become charged by the transfer of electrons, but the total amount of charge possessed by the objects combined by the system of two involved objects remains constant or unchanged. To illustrate this, let's consider that last example we discussed, where you charge by conduction a neutral object using a positive object. So here's a table, and we see columns of before, during, and after in rows of object A, the positive object, object B, the neutral object, and then in the bottom row is the system total. So before the actual process begins, Object A has 300 units of charge, positive 300. The unit there is nanocoulombs. We'll just refer to it as unit. And object B is neutral, so zero. And the system total is th positive 300 units of charge for the two objects combined. Now, during the process, object B transfers electrons to A. And as we mentioned, when object B loses electrons, it becomes positive. And when object A gains those electrons, its amount of positive charge will go down. So we just need to make up a number here. I'm going to make up 100. 100 units of positive charge are lost from, are, are um, 100, I should say, 100 units of negative charge are transferred from B to A, which makes that neutral B now have 
positive 100 units of charge. And because object A has gained this negative 100 units of charge that B lost, A is going to go from 300 down to 200. And if you sum it up, the total amount of charge for object A plus B for the so-called system is positive 300 units of charge. So if you check the bottom row, you see the law of conservation of charge, that the total amount of charge possessed by the system remains unchanged or is constant. One way we sometimes put this is that charge is neither created nor destroyed, but only transferred from one object to another object. The way I like to get students to perceive of charging by conduction is to perceive it as a charge sharing event. When you make contact between the two objects, what is really going on is the objects are sharing their excess charge. It distributes over the surface of the two objects. So when we look at object A, the one on the left, the larger one, that it has an excess of electrons, it has a negative charge. Object B, the neutral one, the smaller one's gonna touch it here. And when it does, electrons can move from object A to object B. So there you see it. I'm going to do it again. I'll go back and forth. You see it, you don't see it. You see it, you don't see it. And, and what's going on up on contact is that you're not gaining or losing electrons. You're just sharing them. Object A is sharing the excess of electrons with object B. It's a charge sharing event. Now, in order for this to occur, electrons have to be able to move from A to B and across the surface between A and B in order to distribute themselves evenly about the larger surface area. And that would never happen with insulators. Only conductors allow for the free flow of electrons across their surface. And so that's why we say charging by conduction requires conductors. Insulators can't be charged by conductors because insulators prevent the free flow of electrons across their surface. So what would happen if you touched, say, a conductor to an insulator or an insulator to an insulator? What would happen then? Well, a number of things, and the first one is nothing could happen. But the second thing is that something could happen, and that covers it all there. And the something that could happen is that insulator could become charged by contact, by touching, but not this conduction process we've been talking about, by a process that I like to call charging by lightning. You'd hear a, a shock, you'd see a visible spark through the air, as excess electrons on one object would jump through the air to the other object, and that occurs if you can get an object really, really charged up, and you touch it to an insulator, and, and now all of a sudden air breaks down and becomes the conducting pathway through which charge jumps from one object to the other. And I refer to that as charging by lightning. But in general, charging by conduction requires conductors. It's at this time in every video, I like to help you out with an action plan, a series of next steps for making the learning stick. But before I help you out, could you help us out by giving us a like or subscribing to the channel or leaving a question or comment in the comment section below. Now for your action plan. Here's three resources from our website and you will find links to each one of these in the description section of this video. Any one of these would be great resources for following up on your learning from this video. Whatever you do, I wish you the best of luck. I'm Mr. H. Thank you for watching.